So was the last episode like the f- first one you've ever listened to? <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to listen from time to time. Oh, really? Okay. I wasn't as horrified by my own voice as I thought I would be. <laughs> Okay. I feel like everyone has that. Do you get that? I don't even hear it anymore. I just can't. Oh, because you did so much editing. So yeah, I've just I've heard too much of my voice now. I just I also would actually get into the conversation again, where I'd be like, good point, Hillary. Like, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I would like actually get hooked. But yeah, I listened to the episode with Lucy, who was delightful. She was. You guys yes. didn't do enough like missing me, though. I was like, oh, you said something like this is going to be our best one, like our <laughs> best episode. I meant like best of the two that, you know, she had been on. Oh, I'm glad you clarified. Because she had only recur. She's the only recurring, you know, co- right. guest host. Yeah. So you were like, it's going to be even better. I took it as... Like, this is going to be better content than when Hillary's on. No, I mean, that's just not possible, right? <laughs> I mean, Lucy's pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a whole bit about, like, why you weren't there, and then I forgot to do it, so. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say you were, like, on assignment in the Yukon or something, you know? Oh. <laughs> that would be great. I love that. Yes. I'm undercover. That's right. <laughs> but you now you've reemerged. <laughs> I've reemerged, yes. No, we uh, just kept missing. That's what it came down to. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had to go to Universal Studios, right? So it was. A... I, that was a fascinating. I knew that Lucy was into Disney but and, and Universal theme parks. But this was like next level. I had no clue just how deep it went. <laughs> Even though we talk about it. But still, the idea of actually becoming a travel agent. That's commitment. Yeah, that's a level of. I, I can understand caring for yourself, but getting excited about planning it for someone else to the extent that you're like starting a side hustle, essentially. I mean, I don't know if she was, I don't think she was doing it for the money. It seemed like you get maybe access to special stuff if you. I think it's purely for the love. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I was, I was blown away. And did you have any follow up from that episode, even though you weren't in it? I, no, I, so I thought that Lucy said something brilliant that she was like joking that you didn't like her solution which was in order to get in order to understand how to do the right model approach you should publish your paper and wait for people to respond (laughs) you so you thought that was brilliant yeah i think that that's like and then i was thinking i think i've given this advice before on the podcast but the evil way to do it is to criticize a bunch of other people in the paper yeah and be like their methods are like bad garbage there's no way they could possibly do this better and then publish it and then i think that's almost necessary because um i think if you the 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 flaw with just publishing a paper that has like your modeling approach is that it assumes that anyone anyone will read it (laughs) yeah yeah no you're actually writing to the small niche of people who care about this field right but if you go out there like criticizing other people i think it increases the odds that someone might read it yeah exactly No, it's true. And I was like, this is what fuels academia. Like, (laughs) holding a grudge. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think what she was saying of like, because she was like, oh, it's like fun collaboration. It should be more collaborative. It should be an iteration. And I agree in theory, but I think given the personalities of like academics, I think it's probably actually been fueled by competition. And I mean, that's okay. Yeah. Because yeah. you can exploit that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit like if you don't feel like doing the literature review, you should just go out there and be like, there's no literature on this topic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just like wait for it to all come in. Like... Right. <laughs> I don't know if I could endorse that, even though I agree that it would work. Yeah. Pretty, I'm pretty sure it would work. I, yeah, I don't know if I could endorse it. You have to be a little soulless. Or you just have to have, like, a sense of humor about it. But, and, like, it's like, com- so I've been listening to uh, Conan O'Brien's podcast recently. Okay. And it's so funny because I watched him a lot as a kid. I ran into him once on New York in New York and have a photo with him. And actually... <laughs> I put up that I had a frame like it's like an I love New York frame I put it up in my office in grad school and one of my colleagues who's from China was like is that your dad 
<laughs> so I was like, I wish that, that would have been fun. But anyway, so I so I got like kind of turned off on him when there was the whole Tonight Show debacle, you know, which I just hadn't really revisited because then I just kind of filed him away and like, uh, I don't watch him anymore and whatever. I'm going to not keep up and bothered by the energy of that. But now, so he came onto the podcast I like, I would listen to a lot called How Did This Get Made? And it was a really funny episode. And then I don't know why. I think I was just like looking for content and I was like, I should try. Oh, I know why. There was a bit that uh, Paul Rudd did on his podcast that was like hilarious and was on Twitter. And I, I like watched it. I was like, that's so funny. So then I went and listened to his podcast and I was like, oh, now that I'm like older and I get comedy more, I get what he's doing a lot more. And well, A, I feel way worse for him about the Tonight Show stuff. Like mm. that was actually a ridiculous situation. <laughs> like I'm, I'm team Coco there. Um, and then like, his comedy is a lot about like making people uncomfortable. Not exactly that, but like you can tell that he revels in like the whole bit with Paul Rudd was essentially about like wasting people's time. You know, it was like, you just wasted like minutes of like, cause when you're on a talk show, you know, it's like so fast and he would always set up this bit where he would show a clip. He would be like, here's the clip from my movie. And then it was actually a clip from this like movie Mac and me that's like been covered on that the how did this get made podcast like a terrible terrible movie (laughs) and it's literally a scene where this kid in a wheelchair like loses control of his wheelchair and like falls off a cliff like (laughs) it's like a comedy though like it's like a little scene in this movie and it's just so bad and then at the end this alien pops up and it's like what anyway You've not seen it or heard of this movie? I've completely lost track of this conversation. It's like, so anyway, the clip doesn't matter, but the bit was funny. So anyway, the point is like in a talk show, you have to be like really, you know, you're like regimented on time. You only have so many minutes. You have to like keep the movie studio happy, whatever. And, um, And so this bit is like the opposite of it where you're just wasting like all this time and everyone knows the joke. And it, he repeat he probably repeated this joke like 20 times, you know? Yeah. And um and it was just like that you could tell he found it hilarious because it was like annoying people. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And so it's like and other comedians like like in the podcast, I'm getting more of a sense of just like how much he like finds it. Like he was talking about his hair and how it just like started he started to do it and then it was like got bigger and bigger. And then he was like one time I was like He was like, I was walking down the street in Ireland and someone was like, like, do you have to feed that thing or so, you know, just something like that, where it like, the person was like bothered by the hair. And he was like, I love it. Like, I'm definitely keeping this hair then because it bothers people. (laughs) And so anyway, the point is, as an academic, that was a very long aside. Uh, It was. (laughs) As an academic, I think if you were publishing papers where you're like needling people, If you had that, like, disposition of, like, finding the humor in it, which I think it is something that's funny, I think it's funny to poke people's buttons if their buttons are, like, ridiculous. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. I think it's a a bit of a high wire act, though. Um. Yeah, so that's the thing. It definitely is. Most people have the stomach for it. I definitely don't have the stomach for it. I don't think I could pull it off, is, I think, the conclusion. But I think, like, if you could... It's kind of a funny bit to, like, every paper, like, needle people, you know, in order to, like, get them to do work for you. (laughs) I think the issue nowadays is that, like, the community, however you want to define it, is just, like, so big, right? Yeah. And that, like, you know, you can't, I think if we all know each other, it's, like, one thing, you know? Yeah. But, like, we don't all know each other. But I think that's where the extreme examples of like comedians is just like they don't mind the whole world being mad at them. I guess that's true. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I think there's a version. The problem is it's just so opposite of the mindset of like, I don't think there's many people out there who are academics who are also like high concept comedians. (laughs) Like, I don't (laughs) know. That's not the combo I feel like you usually see. Yeah. But it's it's worth considering. I may have to resort to this strategy, to honestly, if like I have nothing left. 
the other thing that my other reaction to the podcast episode was that i i honestly like hate the problem you're working on <laughs> <laughs> okay you, wait is it just because i've talked about it so much no no okay. because not and i shouldn't say the problem the situation you're finding yourself in and like trying to build a prediction model and kind of not knowing where to iterate and not feeling like anyone has any good guidance and like not totally understanding if it could get better or what path to take. I, I just, I hate that problem. Like I feel so, uh, I like to have control. (laughs) Yeah. I like to know I'm working towards something and I would just get extremely frustrated. Like, I think I don't like prediction generally for that reason. Well, I don't now. (laughs) (laughs) Like there's some people who love it. It's like the same people who love like betting. You know what I mean? Like I don't like any of that. I was thinking as I was doing this, I I meant to tell you this, like I would have told you sooner if we had recorded sooner, but I feel like the, one of the interesting things about these like very kind of complex and rich uh, machine learning frameworks is that, they're like really good vehicles for just like spinning your wheels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Because like, yeah. there's just an infinite number of like combinations of things that you could do. And like it's it's one of those like, well, it's, you know, it's like it might just be over the next hill, you know. And so if we just like keep going a little bit more, you know, just one more combination of configurations of layers and blah, 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 you know, like could be Horrible. the next one. Right. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah. It goes forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like game design. You need people to win sometimes in order to, <laughs> to be a good game, right? Yes, I guess that's true. <laughs> and then I was also thinking about the fact that like I think there are genuinely people out there who find it fun to continue to iterate on the model and be like, "Ooh, let me try this. Let me try that." Right. Yeah. And it's like that little endorphin rush of seeing the results pop up and seeing if they're better. To me, that's just not there at all. Yeah. And I, I, I know you, I think you saw this thread on Twitter that was about like keeping your GPUs warm. Yeah. Oh my God. It was like, I, I was like, you know, I wouldn't have, I don't think I would have understood that like three months ago. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, it's, it's really easy to fall into this like, oh, let's, I'll just do one more run, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, it's like always the data science teams, like this happened in the data science team at Etsy where they're like, there's kind of like, like, oops, we just spent $100,000 on AWS this month or so, you know, and it's just like, I I just hate that. I don't know. I don't like that at all. Yeah. I know like that represents fun to people. (laughs) I mean, I was thinking about it too of, so for me, and I genuinely mean this, like, I don't think I would have to do literally any statistics to enjoy a data job. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think I'm perfectly fine. Just like carrying the football from like A to B to C of just like establishing the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I do not get like, I want the pile of data and it's, I don't even think I necessarily want to do anything with it. (laughs) (laughs) Besides, like, use it for things. Like, use the raw data for things, right? Yeah. So, I was thinking about that. So, again, I'm like, I had to turn back in my PhD. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you had to get a PhD to realize that, I think. Yeah, it was part of the journey of realizing I don't want to do it. (laughs) I mean, that's not totally true, but it's just, like, yeah, I was having anxiety arising hearing you describe. Oh, God. (laughs) like the problem you're working on i just i hate it because like your images aren't even compelling right no not really so you're just literally this is all like numbers like there's not really much else to it besides that there is a level yes at which exactly that's what it is like at this point in this like i'm just crunching numbers basically oh my god you just need to you need to get out like publish the paper <laughs> Well, I wanted to ask you something, actually, because, like, I was thinking about, like, well, what's going on in my head right now? And um, I was thinking that maybe, like, I don't have the right incentive structure. Oh, no. Yeah, definitely not. Because, like, this, whether this model predicts well, like, nothing really happens. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So you can just, like, spin your wheels here forever. Yeah, like, I I don't know. Is this true, like, in, in, in places where you've worked? It's like, if you... Like, if you have to build a model and, like, 
something actually depends on the performance of that model, does that change like what you do or how you feel about it? I could get, I could probably publish a paper even if the model sucks. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean? no, it's like, totally. you know, no, there's a lot more. It's really different. Like there's so much more pressure to be like, this has to actually deliver on like our quarterly goals. Like you'll have these like, okay, ours objectives. I think it's objectives and key results. Yeah. And now I'm like objective. I'm like, is it objective? Anyway, so it's objectives and key results. So usually as a team at a bigger company, you have OKRs you're trying to achieve every quarter. And so you need the model to like bite off part of that. Uh huh. Which is really hard for data science teams because there's so much uncertainty versus like if you're OKR and a perform on like a back end team, it's like we need performance to get better by X amount. There's usually like a way to know more concretely if it'll work or not <laughs> there's a lot less speculation right and so um so i think data teams resist okrs but yeah it was also i like so right after we stopped recording lucy and i had like a very brief conversation <laughs> where I, I was basically i basically told her you know the problem here is that like i'm pretty sure i've like squeezed all the juice out of this data set and it's just a matter it's just a matter of me like admitting it you know yeah totally <laughs> then that's where her advice is actually best because you don't have to needle people but like once you publish it people will give you ideas that's yeah i mean perhaps yeah yeah, yeah. well or no one will read it so <laughs> one of those two things will well happen. we we did i did get some interesting feedback from max coon actually oh interesting so he <laughs> i think i maybe i made his ears explode you know on that last episode oh so he listens i, I guess so yeah or at yeah, least yeah so max. yeah <laughs> I was like, how did he hear about it? <laughs> so I'm like, I was super excited. I'm like, oh, he, I know he's got the answer, right? Yeah, yeah. Totally. So I'm like, I'm like, I'm all ears. Give me, give me the scoop. And then he comes back. You know what he comes back with? <laughs> he's like, use recipes. No, 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 no. It's not like that at all. It wasn't like that at all. <laughs> I thought he was just going to, isn't he going to come? Let me guess. It's like, why don't you try these like 50,000 things? Not, no, it was if if he had come back with that, I would have been more excited. Oh, okay. What did he actually come back with? He his suggestion was to like analyze the data. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "What? You should look at the residuals, you know, and like see how they're structured and uh, why don't they not, you know?" And I'm like, "Come on, Max, you're like telling me to do work I here. I know. <laughs> like, I don't want to work. I, uh... I want a machine learn, right?" <laughs> I was interacting with a a company doing deep learning stuff. And I don't know if we miscommunicated or what, but it did at one point seem like I was like, don't, do you want the predictions back? And for there was like a minute where it was like, no, we don't need those. Like, I, like that's where I was interpreting. I don't think that's probably what they were saying, but that's how it seemed. It's like, <laughs> yeah, just throw that data back in the pipeline. Like, we're good. And I'm like, oh, OK. Like, you don't want to look at where it went wrong. But then like they came back later. Like, yeah, we definitely want that. So right. like, <laughs> but there's a minute where I was like this is what deep learning is. Like you don't even have to care. Like you don't have to look. So <laughs> yeah. Anyway, obviously I, I mean, obviously I agree with what Max said. He's definitely right. I, I just, I was just disappointed because it seemed like what he suggested would mean me doing more work. Was interesting. But the reason why I was like, he's going to come back and say a bunch of models is just because that's what his tooling is like enabling. Right. Uh, yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Doing a bunch of models. So I guess it's like, he's actually good. Like, data scientist statistician <laughs> yeah he, he gave me the real scoop yeah but i it got me thinking that this is the problem with statisticians in general right yeah like it, relative to say like engineers which is like i feel like engineers are more inclined to be like well you need to try this or you need to build i will be, like i can either build you a solution or you can you need to try this other solution whereas statisticians are more inclined to be like you need to like think about it more <laughs> Yeah. And like yeah. that's not an answer that anybody wants to hear. It's true. It's definitely true. But like if you were looking at the residuals from your model, what do they even mean? Like this is where the problem set you're working on is so unsatisfying to me. Well, I mean, I think the residuals, I'm only like I'm predicting like a univariate kind of like, you know, pollution measure, right? So the residuals to just be like, well, I'm underestimating here or I'm overestimating here, you know. I think those are interpretable. Right. It's not like the residuals of an image or something like that. Right. I guess I was thinking like, yeah, residuals in certain dimensions or something where it's like, oh, 
I'm just thinking about this in like linear regression where it's like you're controlling for one input and looking at the other. You know what I mean? When you like do the residuals just in one dimension. Oh, yes. I see what you mean. Yeah, no, that has, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> well, and also it's like your your features are kind of meaningless. Yeah, I mean, that's the ultimate issue, right? It's like I can look at residuals and let's say there's some really interesting pattern in the residuals. Like how does that feed back into like my original inputs? I'm not 100% sure. Like I can't, exactly. that's the pathway I can't figure out. Yeah, no, and that's what, that's where it's like, this is just numbers. So it's like, You'd have to be like, oh, well, that number correlates to this abstract number, which like maybe if I do this abstract thing to that abstract feature. Well, I mean, it's not completely abstract, right? Because at least with images, you can look at the images. If the, you know, So the images are the original inputs. You can at least look at them, right? Mm -hmm. So for like if this one observation is super outlier from a residual standpoint, right? Then you could like go back and look at that image and see what the issue was. So like that's doable, right? But it's not, but beyond just like looking at a single observation, it's hard to like, you know, it's hard to do that. Like, it's hard to scale that, I guess. I also, I was, I was reflecting now I'm just like rehashing the entire podcast, but also the discussion of like, like the fonts in the scans of COVID patients or like, are they sitting up or laying down? I mean, I do wonder how much like in 10 years students will learn they'll be more intuition because more people have done it and like talked about pitfalls and stuff. Yeah. I mean, so like the, in terms of like the batch effects and like, in the, yeah, in the data. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. And like, I think there will be more aware. I mean, I, I mean, I know I'm more on the lookout for that kind of stuff now too, but um, I think there will be more, but I think like there's still like very little, I mean, even if you were like learning linear regression in class, Mm -hmm. Like, I think we talk a lot about what is linear regression and what are the properties of the estimators and here are the asymptotics and blah, 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 right? But when it comes to, like, actually using linear regression, there usually isn't, like, a ton of, <laughs> like, advice that we give. Um, and I think it just gets worse with with these machine learning approaches. It's kind of like, it's it's always, it's basically, like, aside from, like, like we always talk about, okay, you got to have a training set, you got to have a test set, you got to have a validation set, right? You know, you, right, so you have to, like, yeah. so, like, we teach people how to calculate, like, unbiased estimates of error. But, but, but that's it though. Like, that's all we do. Right. I mean, we don't really like say like, well, here's the strategy for like, here's a, here's like a concrete strategy for like kind of revising your model, you know, based on this output or, you know, it's like, I think that's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that hopefully that will improve over time as we get more experience, you know, doing it. Yeah. I mean, it just has to, there's yeah. no yeah. version where it doesn't, <laughs> but Yeah. But yeah, so my sympathies. I think you should just publish the paper. I'm getting. I'm almost at the point where I'm like, I think it might be just time to d to dump something out there. And are you not happy because the the predictive, the, uh, like the, what do you even call that? The predictiveness is not as high as you want it to be. It's not as high as I would have liked it to be. It's actually not bad, but like the main argument of this paper was going to be that like these data are super easy to get now. Um, and because there's all these APIs and these companies that are like collecting this data. So it's really easy to get this data. If you, and if you could get like a really good prediction out of it, it would be, that would be way simpler than like every other model that's currently out there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not as clean of an argument now because it's like, well, it's not that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, but isn't there still the benefit of like, it's easier to get? Well, that's the, that's a question. Like, do you want to spend a year like collecting all these data sets and like, you know, putting them together and harmonizing them to get like an extra, I don't know, 20% in R squared. I mean, maybe you do. So. Yeah. Wait, which one? Oh, the satellite imagery. You have to like spend the year. No, no, no. The, the, that's no, that's the easy one. The satellite oh, imagery okay. Is easy. Got it. Yeah. The other oh, stuff. Oh, wait. So you're not performing as well as which one's performing better? The satellite imagery or like the old school. Well, the, so there are these models that like combine like lots of different types of data like land use data and road network data and like computer models and like you know there's like a whole and and and, and that's like I mean, it makes sense that that would be better it's using more data right right yeah. um but it's like not easy to do that by yourself and it takes a long time and you have to harmonize all these different you know types of data sets and the, um and it, whereas like you know calling an api to, to like grab a satellite image is pretty easy actually um, I see. So I was hoping that it would be, I didn't expect it to be as good, but I was hoping it'd be like close, you know, like closer. And then you could be like, well, it's not as good, but it's so much easier to collect this data. Right. Yeah. 
So I can see why you're hesitating, because if you publish this and, like, maybe people, like, riff on it, but there's also the possibility that everyone just rejects it, and they're like, it's not good enough. Yeah, and I feel like publishing a paper that's, like, where the message is, like, there are these trade-offs, like, that never flies. <laughs> you know, like, but, like, people want, like, no trade-offs, right? Right. And if it were, if it were, like, a well, but this should be the same, the pressure on them, like, if it were in a business setting... I think you might like push harder and harder if like the ROI is as big as what you're describing and like you can have that trade-off discussion. There's more incentive to have the trade-off discussion. Whereas in academics, like I think the efficiency isn't as big, you know what I mean? Well, it's just not like, it's not really quantified. Like the effort that you have to put into like building a model is not, is factored out you know yeah it's like, exactly it's just like not even part of the paper really um and so i mean there are papers that look at like computational kind of efficiency efficiency right but like the fact that you have to assemble like 15 data sets that that are very complicated and not properly you know aligned that's all just factored you know that's just like ignored essentially yeah but who would be implementing these methods would it just be other academics or would it also be like industry people I could, I don't know, but I don't know if there's a lot of industry in this sense, um, but like government and uh, kind of. Oh, I see. Yeah. So government could be like, oh, this is like drastically decreases the budget if we yeah. use this less accurate measurement device. I was just going to say for an academic, it's like, what's the end goal? Like they just, they would like maybe even be easier to get a grant if they're like, here's the 15 different data sets. Like this will be two years of work and here's all the data sets we need and like fund this. It's super accurate versus if it's like, hey, I have this cheap shortcut that won't be as accurate, but people are going to want these papers. You know what I mean? Like I can see how there's not a push for the, I'm just repeating myself. Not as much <laughs> of a push for efficiency in just an academic setting. Yeah, I, you know, academics don't operate on like <laughs> those kinds of timelines anyway, right? So it's like exactly. But um, anyway, I'll have to think. Maybe I'll have to think of another uh, argument. But yeah, well, I get it. I get why you're like not thrilled to just publish it as is. Then, <laughs> but I did have one more thing that I wanted to tell you about because uh, as I've been on this journey, mm -hmm. I was um trying to figure out how to like run these models faster, right? And um. I, uh, I I I wanted to like file this under the category of like things that Hillary probably already knew but never told me. <laughs> so I was like, I think it runs faster if you run it on Linux, right? Oh, because I was because I I couldn't get like like a recent version of TensorFlow, and so like if I ran it on the cloud Linux cluster, it just run it seems to run faster. So I'm like, all right, well, how do I? So so then I was like, I don't want to. But I don't want to log into the cluster. That's costing me money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. So how do I get? So I was like, I want to just run on my computer. So I. So then I discovered you know, there's like the whole like R Docker kind of world, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So you can just run R in like a container, and it's just like Linux, and it's just boom right there. And uh, I didn't realize how easy it was. It's like super easy. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know that. Oh, you, oh, not, really? Yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time in Docker. It's well, so you have to install Docker, but once you do that, it's like two command lines and then you're running R and Linux basically. So you're saying you aren't even saying it to the cloud. You're just literally running it on your local computer. On my Mac. Yeah. On your machine, as yeah. they say. Your local machine. Yes. But it's like on the Linux portion of it. Right. Well it's just like Or like you in a Docker container that is like Linux inside. <laughs> right. The only downside I think on the Mac is that the Docker has to run like a virtual machine for Linux. And then there's like the container on top of that. Whereas I think if you have like a not, if you have like a Linux, an actual Linux machine, um, you can skip the like VM level, level layer. But then do you even need Docker? Uh, well, then it's just like you're using Docker just for like the convenience of like having everything containerized. Uh, yeah. 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 I think Docker like had its moment of being like a beloved solution to especially like data science and reproducibility problems and i feel like we talked about it a lot yeah but then it kind of like fell out of fashion did it yeah because i think it was like because it was like oh you can just set up a doctor docker container with like the analysis and the data and everything and people can come in and reproduce it uh and they have the exact environment and everything like that 
But then I think it maybe it was just that like maintaining the images was not actually feasible or I don't know something happened where it was like this isn't actually like a good idea <laughs> well I know virtual machines had their moment too um yeah and then it's like oh those are too complicated I what doc virtual, you know like yeah. docker containers are much simpler and the I think ultimately the vibe I got with the docker conversation was like this is not designed for reproducible analyses like it is designed for very specific engineering tasks right and we're okay. trying to like appropriate it in this other way. And that's not actually as feasible and elegant as you think. But then I also feel like in the engineering world, I've seen people being like, I don't actually like Docker as much as like people act like. So what can you do? <laughs> I don't know. Like, so I don't know. I have not. I use Docker at Stitch Fix, but I haven't really used it much. I certainly never. You, I, I'm flattered that you think that I would have known that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've probably used it more than I have. And just to close. That's probably yeah. true. Yeah. And uh, and the reality is I've also abandoned it already. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think actually I've used it probably a lot and not even known it because then the internal tooling teams at like Stitch Fix and Etsy were like obscuring away docker from me you know what i mean like there was oh, like okay. layers on top of docker <laughs> to make it more friendly for me so yeah yeah so the final milestone in this story um is i so one of the issues with the mac is that it doesn't have it doesn't use nvidia gpus right because apple broke up with nvidia like a decade ago right um so they've never used it since um, and so because they don't use NVIDIA GPUs, I, I just assumed that all of like the, the GPU kind of computing infrastructure was like not available to me. Yeah. But then I discovered like six months ago, I guess TensorFlow created this like plugin framework, uh, where hmm. you, like people could just like kind of optimize for their device hmm. and it didn't have to be through like the whole NVIDIA kind of infrastructure. Um, so I guess, so Apple wrote like a library that was like, that accelerates all the TensorFlow stuff on their GPUs whoa so i'm like that's all right. wild it's i know it was like it was like yeah so i so i was like all right let's try this out and, you know after like a billion python installs <laughs> that's because it, isn't tensorflow from google too yes it is yeah yeah so it's like a rare marriage once you get into like computer science they're fine with it right yeah they're maybe yeah. frenemies you know <laughs> so so that but and but then i so i got it to work and uh and it and it, and it worked like and it was like amazing yeah <laughs> it was yeah. like 10 times faster oh that's awesome that's satisfying at least that, that was super satisfying yeah i'm like you should publish a paper about that <laughs> <laughs> well, i don't think there's much to like publish <laughs> maybe a blog post you know yeah you should do a blog post i yeah. feel like people would that was like super it. satisfying yeah, yeah. And, and so i think now i'm at the end state in terms of my computing so i, I did went on quite a journey yeah through the cloud and back how many hours do you feel like you spent modeling for this paper I don't know. It's been a lot, but you know, but most of that time has has been about more like learning than modeling, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it seems like still a lot of time modeling as well. Like it seems like you know, looking at the residuals and trying different. You've tried like quite a few approaches. Yes, I have. Yeah. it's been a long. So it's been like hundreds of hours of modeling. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the project started about a year. Actually, I looked at my Git logs. It's about a year ago. Oh my god! Um, and and yeah, it's not like not like I'm working 100 percent on it, but it's a uh, it has been a long journey. I I hate this. This is why I'm not an academic. Everything you just described, I hate. <laughs> <laughs> like I hate having to come up with computing solutions on my own. Like I want other people to help. I'm realizing where I'm happiest is like using tools from other people. Like I like I'm totally an early adopter. And I like playing with new tools. I don't, I don't know. There's something about like, I know to some degree it's like you're playing with new tools, but I guess I like playing with user-friendly tools. Maybe that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, my tolerance for like not user-friendly stuff is like very, very low. Well, I had like, uh, my early history was all Linux, right? So I'm like used to things that like aren't friendly. So. I mean, I tried, I had like a Linux, I had a Linux machine in grad school uh that i mostly used to play movies which was like the worst possible 
way to have a Linux machine. <laughs> it was like my little TV in my bedroom, you know, I was like, Oh, I want to watch this. Like while I go to sleep and I, uh, but it was like a really old, it was like my college computer and it was running so slow. So I was like, let me try out running Linux and like various people in my lives were encouraging it, you know? Yeah. Never again. <laughs> That's not for me. <laughs> well, I, I, if people don't know and you're using a Mac uh, that you can like use the GPU acceleration after TensorFlow, I'll put the link in the show notes. It's really something else, actually. That's crazy. The, the sad thing that I did though was I was like, okay, you know, so they have the Apple has these new like laptops with their like M1 chip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they have like these like ex these new GPUs, like the custom GPUs on there. So I'm like, all right, now I got to try this out. I don't have one of those, but my son has like a MacBook Air. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to take his macbook air and like install this and see how and see how it runs on there compared to like my 16 inch intel you know MacBook. Pro. i would be so mad at my dad if he did that <laughs> how did your son react to you like stealing his computer uh, he doesn't care he's yeah. why not he's just like a nicer kid than me i think like his relate his, his relationship with computers is like maybe not the same <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he, doesn't, he doesn't care that much, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um. Anyway, it was the but the sad thing was that like his little MacBook Air was like the performance is comparable actually. So yeah, I was a little bit sad by that. But now it makes me want to get one of these new app MacBooks, even though it's not better. Well, well, the newer ones have like these enormous GPUs on them. So oh, I see. Okay, yeah. okay. So not the M1, just. No, or no. Maybe it, it's both the M1, but also bigger. They have like this M1, like Max and Ultra, like that are just like you know these like super uh, multi-core, you know, chips. Mm -hmm. So that they basically just have bigger GPUs. <laughs> anyway, so Ugh. I think my journey has come to a, it's come to a, cl a close, mm -hmm. and uh, I will continue to spin my wheels, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> optimizing yeah. this model. <laughs> oh no. Wait, so that's not the journey hasn't come to a close. Well, I think the technical the technical aspect of it has. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's just like blindly feeling your way through. Exactly. Just grinding it out. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> You're. <laughs> I'm just excited. Part of the reason I'm like feel comfortable and safe doing this is that I feel like at least some percentage of the listeners are gonna be like, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With you, you mean? Yeah, for sure. For sure. But like, I, I also am like, I know that someone who's like, really into like machine learning will be like, ugh, Hillary's not a real machine learning person. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> It'll cut both ways, but I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I mean, it did get me thinking now every time I see one of these articles about like the energy usage of these GPUs. Mm -hmm. like it did I, it, I was like it did start i started like to trigger in my brain like oh yeah that is like a thing isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah there's nothing like doing it yourself yeah to start to realize what's going on yeah like like i mean the computer literally gets hot right and um but then i see like these the, like the latest like uh, nvidia gpu i think has like is like requires like 700 watts of power hmm. which i remember okay, maybe 20 years ago, like the whole computer might only take like 300 watts, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's just the GPU takes 700 watts. Does that require like a special plug? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I just, it requires a special power supply. I see. Wouldn't it be funny though, if eventually, you know how like, I feel like washing machines have like special plugs or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like <laughs> certainly in pottery, like kilns have to have like different plugs you think computers have been going in that direction yeah yeah what if eventually you have to have like your computer hook up <laughs> i mean like there's no way i mean maybe though maybe though for like the like if you're the type of person who's buying one of these like ten thousand dollar max you're okay with like your dedicated office space where there's like the special hookup <laughs> like you plug in your car and then you plug in your computer exactly yeah yeah could be I forgot about that. Yeah, cars are the same. You have to have them come and like install the charger. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same as like a like a washing machine. So if oh, interesting. It's only that much. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. So you could always just sort of like like get a really long cord from like unplug your washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that would be my solution. <laughs> Extension cord across the whole house i wonder how much people's electricity bills go up when you get like an ev well i can tell you mine went up 
for sure. Oh, you have an electricity, yeah, like an electricity car. <laughs> we have electricity. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, and I have a Nissan Leaf. Oh, so that's fully 100%? 100% electric, yeah. Nice. How do you like it? I love it. Like, I love the way it drives. I know. I agree. But the range is pretty short. Um, and so it's like 150 miles. That's not uh, bad. It's not bad, but in the winter, you lose a solid, like, 30 miles. So um, it goes quickly in the winter. <laughs> so it's just literally, like, like around town car totally like it's perfect for around town um and you could drive to washington dc and back it would be make me a little nervous you don't want to be like biting your nails yeah yeah (laughs) it's like my scooter i'm like i don't want to i could probably do it but the idea of getting stranded and having to like call a car right (laughs) you know that's really not a big deal but to me i'm like i can't possibly when we when I first got the car, I got like a message from the you know like BG and E, the power company, that was like your electric bill is much higher than usual. <laughs> I get those every month now. Oh really? It's like I know. I don't even know which of my like twenty contraptions is like <laughs> causing this. And I'm like, I don't care anymore. Stop messaging me. <laughs> I mean, I know one of it is the 3D printer. <laughs> And I'm just like, and also I'm like, well, if everyone else is not working from home and they're like, oh, the average house is like this. And I'm like, well, but I'm working from home. But then again, in San Francisco, a solid proportion of people are working from home. So you're far above average, I would say. Yeah. yeah. I've got like grow lights for my plants. I've got like, <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of contraptions. <laughs> Actually, speaking of cars, I did have an experience that is kind of like a long term follow up for this podcast, which is that I actually. And when I was on vacation in Florida, I actually we rented a car that was not like a Tesla or anything, but it had like self driving kind of capability. They're good now. Have you so have you been in one of these cars? Uh, okay, no, but I've been in a car that had um, its cruise control would adjust based on the spacing of the cars around it. So yeah. that is a, a version of yeah. self driving. That's what I'm and talking about. Yeah, it is a. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I so I had the same thing where I rented a car. Somehow I got like freaking brand new. It was like two thousand miles on a Honda Civic, and I was like, yes, I love this. And I was so excited. I and I was talking to like my family, and my dad's girlfriend was like, oh, I tested how far it could go, and it literally will go to a stop. Like. You don't have to turn it off. It'll like, so it's not just slowing down a little, it's slowing down like all the way. Like if there was like, like standing traffic, it would just stop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I loved it. This one could like, it was could see, clearly see like the lines. Cause it was definitely like navigating within the road lines, you know? Oh, that's right. My dad was talking about that too, but they were both like, turn that off immediately. Like it's actually really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Cause I was, I was, I was, I was like super fascinated with this, right? And so, and I realized that there's like two whole systems that like have to work. To, like it did occur to me. The first one there's like the sensor system, right, uh-huh. which has to like detect the environment. And like what it, what makes me laugh is like that's like a whole field of it into itself, right? Like it's a whole field of machine learning. Yeah. But then like then there's like the whole control system that has to react to the environment, right? Right. And that's like yeah. an, another field of study, right? <laughs> and so you like you can sense the control algorithm like moving you like kind of like oscillating back and forth as it tries to like essentially dampen you know the you know the the kind of where you are in the road and trying to get you back in the middle so it's like ping pong ball like yeah eventually it'll get there it'll settle down yeah but it's like but but, so if you just so one time i just kind of like touched the wheel a little bit and then it had to like oscillate back and forth until it kind of like got back to the middle like it can't just like turn back um I feel like that's unpleasant. It is unpleasant. I, that's why I didn't use it after a while because it's like it, the control algorithm. You can see it's one of these like classic control algorithms where you, you get like a sine wave that kind of dampens, you know? Yeah. And um and and then so you can, so it doesn't just like come back to the middle. It has to kind of like overcorrect a little bit and then overcorrect a little the other way. And yeah. I'm sure that's what my dad was talking about then because it's yeah. That's interesting. I wonder how much these are getting used right now. Like it's probably just early adopter nerds who are like. I'll power through my gut reaction to being uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> but I, I mean, this, I didn't like, I just ordered the re- regular old, like rail car. And this is just what yeah. I got. So yeah. no, same. Yeah. I mean, I bet, I guess my Honda must have had it, but I, 
adored the cruise control thing though <laughs> like i was like this is it this is what cruise control is always meant to be it should be reactive like if someone's like because like whenever i do cruise control it's constantly like you know the little button that's like up and down and i'm always like slow down slow down like right yeah the button. yeah yeah so anyway no more button for Good you. job, data, real data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I had all these thoughts about like putting my life and my family's lives like in the hands of whatever data scientist was like writing the algorithm that day. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. But that's what we do with planes, so what can you totally. do? Totally, yeah. Yeah, we're just not as like close. Well, yeah, yeah, we're not like, li- like we're just not like in it, so yeah. Yeah, so you can't like, you're, you're you're not like, oh, I used to hold the steering wheel on this plane. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, so, I don't know, there's nothing, there's no lesson learned there for me, I just, uh, it was just the first time, it was very interesting for me. Yeah, no, I, it's like, I'm responding in part, because I'm like, ooh, I just had that too, like, it's, I had the exact same journey of like, <laughs> That's where, again, that's where, like, I don't want to mess with GPUs, but I will totally, like, every time I drive, be, like, tinkering with the settings to be, like, what's it like here? What's it like this way? You know, like. You're, like, reverse engineering the algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I need that, like, facade of user friendliness. Like, I don't, I get, I get frustrated quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but you've, tri- you've driven in a Tesla, haven't you? I have, yeah, yeah. They're pretty easy to rent in San Francisco. Yeah, is that any? Is that much different in terms of? The... Uh, it's probably similar. I didn't actually play a lot with the self driving because I was renting like 2016 models. I, I used to. Oh. do it. I haven't done it since like the pandemic. So. I see. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and then oh, I bet the part that I liked was what you get with your Nissan Leaf, where it's like more of a go kart feeling. When yeah, you're hitting the pedal. Yeah, which I. I was just talking to someone whose husband bought a Tesla and I was like, it's actually really fun. Like, I get it. I, yeah. get, like, I do get it. Yeah, it's a great feel. And then now when I drive like a gas car and it has to like change gears and stuff, it, I just get really annoyed. Yeah, I yeah. agree. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to mention was uh, I, I put this on Twitter, but I, I had one of these like I had to I had like a reservation on Expedia. Mm. I had to cancel it. It was like a hotel reservation or something. Because Lucy came up with like <laughs> the like hotel you could stay on, like totally, was, yeah, Harry exactly. Potter's, you know, Diagon Alley or something. Like she got a good deal. Well, actually, Lucy's my travel agent now. Actually, so I have yeah, to like, yeah. change. Yeah, <laughs> but um, it used to be you could cancel a reservation just by like clicking a link, which I thought was pretty convenient, you know. Yeah. But now you can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, have it. It's, 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 I think you can. Well, not this time. You had to like. You had to start a conversation with a virtual chatbot or agent. I hate stuff like that. It's <laughs> this is horrible. your fault. You know, this is. I mean, not you in particular, but like your people. You know, I, it's true. It's like, oh, let's A/B test this new. Like, it's basically deciding we want more friction. Yeah, like clicking the link too easy, right? Yeah, which I can see from a business standpoint. Like, maybe it is too easy. Yeah. Exactly. It's a marketplace. So that's why you're always balancing the sellers, in this case, the hoteliers or whatever, yeah. with the buyers. And someone's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not me, apparently. Yeah. But that stuff is so, like, borderline unethical, I feel. Like, I don't know. That's where, like, company values have to come into play. You mean, like, introducing friction via a chatbot? Yeah, to like make, I mean, because li- literally everyone inside knows what they're doing, right? Yeah. Like no one's like, oh, this will actually be a better user experience. <laughs> well, let me explain to you the, the user experience. So I pull up the chatbot window. I'm like, whatever, I'm ready to do this, right? So I tell them I want to cancel. Mm-hmm. And then, so then the chatbot like comes back. It's like, oh, okay. It's like, do you want to cancel this reservation? And then it like, it actually suggested answers. Oh, Right, it's a. It's, it was like like yes, I do want to cancel, or no, I don't want to cancel, or I don't, I, yeah, I don't know, yeah, yeah. So like, so I just like clicked the suggestion, right? Yeah. And then it was like okay, and then it like came back again with something, and then it had more suggestions, and I just clicked one of the suggestions, and then that was it. Like I didn't type anything. Yeah, so it was like three buttons instead of one, basically. Right. So like, why couldn't they just have yeah, like those those sites where it's like, are you sure you want to cancel? Are you sure you want to cancel? Yeah, I guess it was their version of that, right? Yeah. 
I mean, I like I'm sure if they if they came on here to defend themselves, I'm sure they'd say something like people cancel thinking that it's something else, blah, blah, blah. This is like our UI for cutting down on tickets or I don't know what. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, there's some justification for it. But someone had an OKR that was like cut down on mistaken cancellation cancellations or something like that. Yeah, because, like, I can, again, this is exactly what, like, a PM would be saying. It's like, well, but it's such a bad experience if you accidentally cancel and then you can't rebook it, like, and that's happening, you know? And so, and then, and then that's where within the company, you might have the, the person who's leading tickets is, like, 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 their KPI is cutting down on tickets for the customer service. Right. And then you have a different team who's like their thing is like the net promote promoter score of client experience. Right. And so then it's just a showdown between those two within the company. <laughs> <laughs> and, and who won in this case? Well, the, the CX ticket people. Yeah. But then it's like, you know, that the strategic people like definitely in a conversation at some point, someone was like, I mean, is it the end of the world if less people cancel? Like, <laughs> it's like let's, make, let's be real though. Yeah, we yeah. make more money that way. I don't know. So it's I don't. Yeah, I did have I did have the experience where I was like, I want to cancel this, and then I saw that this like chatbot thing came up. I'm like, oh, I'll do it on Monday. You know, so I did wait right. like, yeah. like, and if I yeah, I could have that could have just gone on. Who knows, right? The other thing I hate that's like in this vein is when you are going back to an app, you have an account, and the sign in page is like a huge thing that's like sign up. And then at the very bottom, like tiny letters, it's like already have an account. Click yeah. here. And I'm just like, oh my God. Like that's everything now. I know. It's like I know that you know you have me. I've already converted. And so you wanna like like you know you can use me more. <laughs> you know that I won't leave just because the sign up's slightly harder. They're prioritizing the new users. Yeah. I just I just thought it was funny that like the whole chatbot thing was like a facade. Like it was just like yeah. like the window for me to type was there. Yeah. And like but I would have thought that you would want people to feel like they have some sort of control over the situation by allowing them to type something. Well, I'm sure if you like went down a sufficiently complicated path. Was there one that was like other and then Yeah, type... I think there that there was, yeah. Yeah. So that it's it is for certain use cases you'll get there. I have to say that in general, I think the like chat with the virtual agent or whatever the equivalent is, is actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, I'm not always so adverse to it. I, I'd rather do that than a phone call, honestly. Like, yeah, I mean, same. So. I had an experience once with customer service where I was like having to text them. And yeah. I was I, like, that's yeah. not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Apple has that, like, because I have their like credit card. Um, oh yeah so if you want to like do something with the credit card you just text them and then i definitely prefer that to like fraud calls from like chase being like (laughs) yeah press one if that transaction was right (laughs) yeah i don't know yeah it's like i don't i just i'm so frustrated with how product development (sighs) i mean this is i lucy mentioned in our twitter spaces we're both like going off the deep end of like what's the point of statistics anymore oh that's a dark place i know and then it's like with product development it's just like does it always have to become dumb you know what i mean <laughs> like <laughs> like it just seems like it always has to become like these like really teeny tiny decisions and like like the kpi driven thing like I, on the one hand i get it but it just seems like you lose the big picture really fast yeah and like okay here's the premise In a sufficiently big room, like, so with sufficient number of people and ambiguity about, like, who's in charge, I think that you just end up spinning your wheels. Like, I think that's like a, that probably converges to one, you know, like the more people are in the room. The probability of what? Of like debating pointless stuff and not keeping focused on big picture. Yes. Yeah. And so it seems like companies just like fall into that eventually, no matter what, without like, and maybe it's partly going public or what, I don't know, but it's. I mean, I think you might be right. I think that this might be a function of like human organization. (laughs) Yeah. And then it's like, yeah, it's like our population is so big that it makes sense to do these like scaled solutions 
but then with them comes like orgs that are dysfunctional uh yeah yeah with an increasing probability of one like <laughs> it i don't know it just I'm done with it. I'm done with the topic. I have nothing to add. I just okay. want to keep ranting about it. But <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be the podcast without you ending on a rant, right? Yeah. I mean, just humans, like the amount of complicated human interactions in like these huge companies is like too complicated. I don't know. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like maybe like our species just like can't handle it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> do you think that's possible? Like, and then I don't know the people in charge are the best at like handling it as well as they like i i do you think that there's some perfect solution for how to organize like a ten thousand dollar or ten thousand person tech company not i don't think there's one um yeah i don't think so i mean i think but i guess the question i have for you is like what are you are you saying that like these problems manifest in like whatever product they're producing yeah okay to some degree, yeah. So it's like you start to get these like weird decisions that don't make a ton of sense, and you can almost like visualize the power struggle between the teams, right? Yes, that had to happen, right? And the companies are trying to keep too many people happy, so they can't like continue to make all the people happy. So these trade offs happen. You know where you often see that is in if you ever watch these like tech keynotes, mm -hmm. like some companies, like there's like fifty people who come out and talk. Mm -hmm. because like everyone's got to get their set you know, everyone's got to get their stage time in you know you can almost kind of see like the bureaucracy of the company just like <laughs> on stage you know like with the apple keynotes or whatever well yeah apple keynotes didn't used to be like that's the thing that's interesting yeah. like you, they used to be just like steve jobs just up there you know doing right, his thing right uh and since they've kind of like spread it out amongst more people well that's the thing without the leadership like you almost need like the cult leader you know a little bit yeah i mean i think part of it is also like if a company gets yeah like you said if a company gets to a certain size like it's not possible for one person to have any to, like reign over the whole thing yeah yeah and i think that's what happened to Apple. But Apple was already huge when Steve Jobs was at the helm. So, well, only at the very end, right? And even that, even since he's died, you know, he died in 2011. Um, yeah, that's so true. it's it, they've they've added like two trillion to their or more than two trillion to their market cap. So, oh my gosh. Um, so it's there's been a lot of growth, but anyway, yeah, I think you're right. Like I think you see it. It just it's like it just comes out. It can't not come out. You know. Yeah, and like it's it to tie it back to data science. It's like. At what point does it make sense to start paying people to like go chip off that 0.01% improvement or what? You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. At some point you do the ROI calculation. You're like, it's worth it because the scale we're at, like that tiny percentage actually translates to a lot of dollars. So it justifies the salary of like a PhD computer scientist or something. <laughs> right. But then it's just like, I think. I think the thing is, it's like, we act like that's like, and that's satisfying work. And it's like, no, it's not. I don't know. Like, it's. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like the question for me is like, yes, like if you put it into a spreadsheet, it does come out like positive, right? In right. the sense that like, yeah. yes, numerically, it makes sense to do this. But is there like another metric that maybe we can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look at exactly. that's like, are you sure it makes sense to like grind away another 0.01%? And that's in tech. There's such a, and again, this is something I. I want to talk to really experienced managers about like their actual philosophy versus like the whole like servant tech or what. I don't even know how you say it, but it's like this idea that like the, the servant the manager. Yeah. It's like the manager is actually serving the ICs. It's just like when you have like the most boring mind numbing work, is that really true? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, is this, it doesn't seem like that can, that's kind of like, seems like a facade to me. Yeah. Yeah, when you're talking about like, again, the spreadsheet says that we should do this and like adding this little chat bot, like whose life is better? Because it's like, I am so happy I like added this chat bot. <laughs> Whatever summer intern was assigned to do it, I guess. Yeah. And it's like, they'll be happy about the technical skill, but then you're like almost incentivizing people to be really myopic about just the tool set and right. not the bigger picture. Right. Yeah. Because you can't look, have them looking at the bigger picture because then they'd be like, I just made my parents' lives more annoying. <laughs> I don't, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, you got yeah. to gotta, gotta picture the whole system, you know? It's like, you can... 
yeah, like we need to squeeze some dollars out of people unsatisfied with their hotel booking so that they don't change. Like, I don't know, whatever. I'm getting really cynical. <laughs> All right. Well, we better end there then. I know. Yeah. There's no solution is what I'm saying. <laughs>